Okay, so I think we're on the air, and uh, first thing we need to do is make sure that audio is working. There's probably a little bit of a lag on this, and um, so please, somebody in the chat, let me know if you can hear me. And I'm probably coming out the left side if you've got stereo running. Oh, Andy, cool, <laughs> you can hear us. Fantastic. Okay, so hopefully you can also hear Vela. Um, tonight I have Vela Georgiev here. Vela is an engineer who has um, done a lot of business with Chinese manufacturers and companies. And uh, she led an innovation tour. Many of you would have seen the video that I did last year, which was um, a tour of IT, where we had a look at the, um, the Sonoff and how it was manufactured. That particular tour was done on a trip which Bella organized. So what I thought we would do, it, a lot of people who watch this channel would be really interested in issues around manufacturing. We're into home automation, but also gadgets in general. And it's really interesting to see how things come together. And a lot of people have got ideas about projects they would like to turn into slightly laggy and noisy. Oh, that's a pity. Um, not much I can do about that right now, but hopefully the, um, <laughs> the lip sync won't be too annoying. Uh, so if you've got an idea for a product or you're working on something that you want to take from a concept, something that you've just used as a, um, you know, you put it together as a hobbyist and you want to turn it into something that you can take to market. Uh, Bella is a person who knows all the, way you go, the ways you go about that. So first off, Bella, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself, the, uh, the sort of work that you do in general, and um, we'll talk about how it came about that you organized these tours. Thanks, John. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Bella. Uh, I've been an engineer for about 15 years. I studied computer science and uh, electronic engineering, and I ended up um, in a company uh, initially that was working at smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I um, actually decided to do some research for them uh, around um, particles and light scattering and interaction with um, lasers with smoke. I looked cool. at how that scattered and, and, and sort of what signals we could pick up on the video. Mm -hmm. um, that was a couple of years of uh, research for the company where we gathered uh, that data and that data was then used to uh, inform some ideas around new product design. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we ended up making a new kind of smoke detector. Uh, it was a, a sort of, uh, quite a novel product uh, and very uh, sensitive mm -hmm. uh, and used in very sort of specific applications. So I actually spent about 10 years with that company in total, going from that research aspect to collecting the, the data to um, then working on the product design uh, with, with the team uh, coming up with uh, a few different designs. So we found the one that was going to be the right fit for the market at the right mm -hmm. cost, uh, and then taking that through to manufacturing. We manufactured it initially in-house uh, and then offshored it to um, a company overseas. And so that whole process uh, actually took about 10 years. Okay, uh, that's a long time. A couple of years spent uh, gathering data. Mm -hmm. um, we then probably spent uh, maybe sort of uh, a couple of years going down a particular uh, product type um, and it was sort of going to be a high end smoke detector. Mm -hmm. And then at one point we um, looked at sort of the product market fit, the other things that were available in the market and decided that we needed to shift the focus of the quality cost point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of caused an iteration in the product. Um, and obviously being a, a safety device, there's quite a lot of regulations that go along with that. Yeah. So the time to market the approval process is, yeah, um, is, quite, is quite, lengthy. quite lengthy. So yeah. being able to get all of that and then sort of being able to uh, sort of get to the point where offshore and manufacturing that successfully. And what I found during that process was that as I started off in the research and the design and then made certain decisions and then got through to manufacturing, mm -hmm. I realized that knowing what I knew when I got to manufacturing, I wouldn't have actually made some of those decisions okay. at the design phase. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of started to, I guess, in, inform my thinking a little bit more and knowing how the, um, how the decisions that we made of design impacted what was going to be manufactured with the cost, the quality, mm -hmm. the kind of assembly that the person needed to do, the compromises that one made. So all of that, um, I guess, I, I sort of hadn't given it as much thought being a younger newer engineer than I did sort of once I'd sort of gone through this process and so by the end of it um, I kind of decided that that was where I wanted to 
uh, put my attention to, and it was really around that uh, new product introduction or um, that manufacturing aspect, the transition from um, prototype and product development in mm -hmm. those first couple of thousand and, and how those processes scale and how one makes informed decisions to ensure that right quality um, and cost are considered. Okay. So um, you saw that entire process right from the early research into the particular technology that was going to be used all the way through small-scale manufacturing and then large-scale manufacturing. And as you were going through that, did you have experienced engineers or production engineers in the company? Or these, you said that there were some things that you would have changed, you would have gone back and done it differently. Um, was there no one around that saw those things coming? So it, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. I think it wasn't the case that there wasn't people around. I was actually in a very experienced team. I was probably the, well, I was eventually the graduate or the junior engineer and sort of worked my way up being there so 10 years with that company. But the thing that happens is sometimes you have time pressures mm -hmm. uh, and cost pressures and things that uh, drive you to make a decision that might be for right then and there or you think about the fact that you know, the product will iterate over time and it will mm. improve over time and, and you've got the time to go back and, and fix something. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's not necessarily uh, the case or you've invested a lot of money into compliance and mm. you've done 95% of your compliance and you need those last couple of percent to get through mm -hmm. and you find an adequate workaround. Yeah. And that adequate workaround means that something's going to happen in manufacturing or a process that, you know, had you had more time and... Mm. and you, know, you might have gone back and done it differently, yeah. but because of different pressures, you then you know might live with that, mm. and then you come come to think of it, you might not actually go back and re redo that part of certification because of the cost involved. So yeah. there's constantly compromises um, to be made along along the way, and it's not necessarily all driven by a lack of uh, experience or inexperience. It mm -hmm. was more, I think, for me when I sort of looked at some of the um, reflections, I, I sort of thought I might have advocated a little bit more for certain things had I really you know, okay. you pushed a little bit harder in certain directions. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. impact it was going to take. And, you know, I had the rare privilege of mm -hmm. also having to uh, be part of that assembly process early on and having to put the product together. So yeah. I really well, That's got a to, really good way to learn about it. <laughs> I really got to bear the brunt of, of some yeah. of the decisions that we made. And sometimes it was because we're going from that process from the prototype of pilot production. So you might have mm. made a hundred or something and you've made certain compromises in mm. the manufacturing processes that you've used that are already going to be resolved when the tooling comes along, but you still yeah. got to deliver that product and those hundred might be a little bit more painful mm -hmm. to assemble and those sort of things. So yeah, and and that really really that that. Yeah. Mm. So throughout that whole process, you obviously learned a lot yourself. So you gained all of this knowledge about how to take an idea from concept to production. And then can you tell me about how that led to deciding to run the innovation tour? So um, after I finished up my time with that, particular company, I went on to work in uh, another company where I um, did a, 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 I guess, sort of the supply chain and operations as well as the management of the production. Mm -hmm. And for this particular company, that also involved scaling up the manufacturing. So when I joined their company, uh, most of the manufacturing was done in-house. They had outsourced certain sub-assemblies, mm -hmm. but overall they were still uh, uh, assembling in-house the, the box build. But there was limitations with the infrastructure, the staff availability, and also the ability for them to really invest in the facility and those sort of things. So there mm. was a, a business decision there to be able to look at um, finding an outsourced manufacturing partner that would take on the, uh, the box build and the company could really focus on the software and R&D and find okay. the right manufacturer, manufacturing partner for that. So um, with that, I actually involved, I think, three or four different product transfers, mm -hmm. um, products of various kinds and, and various complexity being uh, transferred to a few different manufacturing partners. And so during that time, uh, I sort of got to work even more so in into Asia and making some trips into Malaysia and China, mm -hmm. uh, looking at um, various uh, factories and manufacturing partners, selecting them, transferring the product, being there for the pilot builds, going off to visit suppliers to resolve quality issues. Mm. So all, all of those kind of things that um, you kind of do in the transfer product and, and, and select components. Um, and as I sort of I spent maybe it was about three and a half years with that uh, company and then the circumstances uh, would have it, I um, ended up finishing my time there and decided that I wanted to uh, pursue a little bit of 
freelance or consulting work. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, I, I kind of wanted to figure out what exactly it was that I was going to do. Yeah. And so I took some time to go to China. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I took uh, about six weeks to six weeks and sort of planned my own little study tour. Mm -hmm. I had some ideas about wanting to know more about the ecosystem. I, I had over time become really involved in startups. Uh, you know, I had an interest in startups and startup accelerators and wanting to see how all of this came together and the ecosystem and, well, I guess Shenzhen's the place to go for that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to get to know China on a little bit more of a personal level, not just a business level. I'd always been there for a few days here and there, particularly visiting suppliers. Yeah. But this time, I actually also took the time to do a little bit of travel around China and yeah. really connect with Spend the culture. Spend some time and just looking around. And, yeah. Yeah. And so when I came back from this trip, I was telling people about the fantastic time I'd had away mm -hmm. and, and sort of the, the people I'd met and the things I'd learned about the ecosystem. Um, and one person in particular uh, commented to me that if I was doing another trip like this, mm -hmm. that they would be really interested in coming along. And I sort of thought, well, that's my business trip. I mean, I wouldn't, yeah. really, you know, wouldn't really bring people on a business <laughs> trip. Yeah. But then I thought about it and I thought, well, I could organize a trip for others. Mm. Um, and that's sort of how the idea came about. And I sent mm -hmm. off a little test survey to a few people to sort of see what they thought about it and mm -hmm. got really positive responses. So mm -hmm. I thought, why not? Yeah. And that's a, um, a pretty big undertaking because not only were you taking a group of relative strangers, um, you're taking them overseas to a country uh, where English is not the uh, the main spoken language, although there are plenty of people that can speak English. So just organising a trip like that would have been a really big job. Uh, did you realise at the start how much was involved, or you knew it was going to be a, a big deal? Oh, um, I, I actually had a little bit of insight into what it takes to organise um, some group trips. Um, I used to uh, be involved in uh, some martial arts activity and because mm -hmm. of that we used to actually do some trips overseas. Okay. Um, and while on a completely different scale logistically, mm. I did have a little bit of an idea about what it might take to um, you know, organise a group and put together mm. a bit of an itinerary and, and those sort of things. But that was quite informal. Uh, this was a pretty big undertaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was far more than... Uh, Kind of what I anticipated, but once I got started, it, you know, it was, wasn't like I was going to stop. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, for everybody out there that's watching, um, if you've got any questions through this, I'm going to keep an eye on the live chat. So, put questions in the chat and I can pass on anything to Bella. Um, what we're going to do is talk about the, um, the trip that happened last year and uh, some of the plans for the trip coming up. So, if you're interested in electronics manufacturing, what the scene is like in China, then please ask questions. And if you had specific questions about the tour itself, like when is it leaving and you know all of those sorts of things, um, ask those as well. So uh, the, um, the trip that happened last year, uh, and just <laughs> for those that missed the start of the, uh, this live stream, yes, I was on the trip as well and I absolutely loved it. Um, but what I'd like to hear from Bella is uh, any feedback you might have had from other people that went on the trip and what sort of experience did they have? <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question because uh, I think before um, the, the, the tour we sort of spoke a little bit and people had a sense that it was a, um, everything was organised when we got there. But um, I remember when we got there and we got to the hotel, which was in, um, I think, Bay, right, right, you know, right where the electronics markets are. And mm. one of the people sort of commented that they, they thought that we um, might be, you know, some sort of hostel accommodation. Mm -hmm. You know how great the location was. Or those sort of things. So there's quite a few, I think, positive comments throughout the, um, the tour because uh, I think in some cases a lot of people didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, People had some people had never been to China, sort of completely blown away by what Shenzhen is, yeah. uh, the metropolis that it is. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a twenty-four hour, seven kind of kind of city. So I think the experience of that was um, quite a positive culture shock for people, and, yeah. and, and you know, really yeah. um, sort of positive in sort of being able to to do that. Yeah, I we, think just from my point of view, my perception before I went to China the first time was I think, and it, it's a very strong misconception is that China is not was not as high tech as it really is. And I was amazed to land and discover that 
But the way so many people describe it is that when you travel to China, you're not traveling in a pla in place or distance, you're traveling into the future. And when you arrive in Shenzhen, it really is like arriving in a city of the future and coming back to Melbourne, Australia, it's like going back in time 10 or 15 years. And if Melbourne can be as high tech as Shenzhen is now in 10 or 15 years, I think we'll be doing pretty well. The, um, the things like their, uh, their transport infrastructure is just amazing. Their public transport is so fast, so clean, so cheap. Um, the facilities over there are incredible. And for me personally, that was a really big thing, was just arriving and feeling like I'd stepped into a science fiction movie. It's like the city of the future. And I think that is made even more, the, the impression is made even stronger because most people go to China with the preconception that it is not really a very modern um, country, but it is incredibly modern. I think sort of one of the, the things when we think about the concept, that misconception or conception of what people have around manufacturing, even now when you ask people to think about manufacturing and think about China, mm. most people will picture a bunch of people in their sort of anti-static codes hunched over a bunch of desks in a row, yeah, so sort of solaring and away and, yeah. and doing stuff. And while we certainly got to see an element of that as well, mm. uh, we also went to High Terra and mm -hmm. we got to see Industry 4.0 and we got to see a you know, flexible, fully automated assembly line. And mm. if I recall, I think you tweeted that you're in heaven. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, you know, it was being able to see that broad range um, of options that are available, but also mm. just look at how things have progressed and that rare opportunity to be inside a factory, whether it is in China or anywhere else, it's a privilege to be able to go inside these facilities yes. Yes. Um, and have uh, the companies host us, mm -hmm. being able to show their te technology and processes mm -hmm. and, and share that expert knowledge that they have around how they've actually gotten to this journey. So mm -hmm. we've actually been able to hear how companies uh, have invested in equipment, what their aspirations are in terms of their growth, mm -hmm. how they want to develop for themselves and for their customers. So mm -hmm. it's it's something that is it's sometimes difficult to explain to people unless they're really um, sort of involved in this. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was sort of something that people um, were really appreciative of when we got there and the welcoming that we had from the various factories. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things, you know, when, when we came back, um, uh, one of the people who came on the tour, uh, she, you know, she particularly commented, uh, she, uh, so I, I helped her connect with the factory here and she sort mm -hmm. of let me know that, um, you know, the, the factory here was just like what you see in China. It was, it was, it was the same, and she kind of had this uh, knowledge and skill in how to be able to deal with someone here, mm. just as she she'd had there. And she, yeah, uh, you know, I think was a little bit surprised that it was so, uh, so similar. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and that sort of thing. We had uh, some people who have gone on to um, work with some of those factories and and and, and order some parts or, mm -hmm. or get some uh, expert knowledge or. Uh, uh, opinion. We've had some people who've uh, returned to, to China and, and just sort of really felt that they were able to engage with the country a little bit more, having had mm. that sort of soft landing and introduction, yeah. and then being able to take that on their own. Yeah. Well, uh, we've got a couple of little video clips, including comments from people that were on the tour. So I think now is a good time to play a little clip uh, from uh, Sarah. And we also have a few questions that have popped up in the chat, so we'll get to those in just a moment. But uh, keep putting questions in there. I haven't forgotten about it. We'll get back to that. So um, this is a very brief clip from Sarah. I think before I went to China, this process of manufacturing was something I felt like I had to give to somebody else because I didn't understand. And that's not necessarily just manufacturing in China, but it's also kind of manufacturing in Australia. Whereas now, after seeing how things are made, how things are put together, what's important, I feel like I can kind of control our manufacturing process because I kind of understand the kind of the series of steps that needs to be taken to get what we need at the end of it. Now, we couldn't actually hear the, uh, the audio of that. Um, because I was just playing it from a, uh, a file on my computer and I've got it muted right now. So I'd be interested to know, did anybody hear the audio coming out of that video? Um, that'll tell us whether things worked or not. So, okay, so a couple of questions. Um, scrolling back. And so um, Toby made the comment, it's a shame we don't have any electronics hubs the way there is in China. Um, yeah, so... The, um, the experience of being within the Australian ecosystem is totally different. I think the, uh, 
the interesting thing about being in Shenzhen, it's a little bit like uh, Silicon Valley, as Silicon Valley is to software, where you get all of the companies together, you get so much talent in one place. And in Shenzhen, you've got all of these, um, this concentration of companies and suppliers that uh, all relate to each other as well. So you've got the entire supply chain available to you and you can achieve everything from concept through to production right there in one place. And yeah, it is a pity that we don't have that, but that's really what makes Shenzhen this magical place. Uh, so uh, Station 240 has a question, which is, how do you go about asking a Chinese supplier to modify a product to suit your need, design changes, or better quality parts? Um, so I assume in that case, Station 240 is talking about an existing design or an existing product, and then have maybe a white label supplier, and having that um, tailored to suit your particular needs. Do you have any experience with that, or have you worked primarily with brand new designs? Uh, a, a little bit of both. We have, we have had some um, manufacturers who've been able to, um, I guess, make some small amount of customization mm -hmm. um, on, on primarily what is, what is their design. Um, it mainly comes down for myself to communication mm -hmm. and, and knowing who it is that you are dealing with to begin with. Um, there is, a, I guess, the process of being able to outline, I guess, what you want and, and understanding the appetite for those changes mm -hmm. uh, and the cost burden that might be associated with that. So, um, you know, being able to know whether your changes are, uh, are reasonable mm -hmm. um, and if, you know, if it's a, sort of a, a minor thing to say, if you've got a case or something and you're asking for an extra hole or something versus yeah. where you're asking for a complete sort of redesign. Mm. So often you can you can start the conversation and see whether they're amenable to something at all and if they are to what extent and, and whether it's actually going to be a completely new thing for them and they have to invest in um, non non occurring and hearing expenses mm. and R&D time or whether it's a, a minor modification that they would quite easily be able to do. But I think it's about mm -hmm. st starting to have that go over it. So how to go about it is to actually just start the conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. And I suppose a large part of it is um, it comes down to the supplier and if they are accustomed to working as a white label supplier and uh, I know this is the case for a lot of case manufacturers for example, they're very used to having off the shelf standard case designs and then you, you specify what slots and things you want milled in it, what you want printed on it, what colour you want and they will do that in surprisingly low volumes. Uh, so if you're dealing with that sort of supplier, it's very easy to have it customised to suit your needs. But if you're dealing with a company that makes a brand name product and it's sold under their brand, it could be a totally different story. Great. Um, okay, so uh, there was a question from... Oh, okay, scrolling back. Uh, Andy... Hey, Andy <laughs> asked... Um, and for those of you that don't know, uh, Andy came on the trip as well. <laughs> um, describing Hytera in more detail would be good. Okay, so I think we'll take a very brief detour from talking about the trip now and talk about Hytera in particular because this was um, this was really part of the, the culture shock where we're stepping into the future experience. Um, and it really highlights the difference between what our expectations of Chinese manufacturing are versus what they can be at the extreme end, at the, the really top end manufacturers. So would you like to explain a little bit about Hytera? <laughs> so uh, Hytera is um, a company that manufactures their own telecommunication equipment and uh, around sort of walkie talkies and, and sort of you know, in that life uh, safety um, kind of category. Uh, they also have a branch that does EMS, electronic manufacturing services. Mm -hmm. um, and within that EMS, they're able to manufacture their own product as well as manufacture product for other people mm -hmm. and, and companies. And uh, the setup or the facility that they have, um, the, and in particular, um, I guess the one that, that we visited was uh, aiming to, uh, you know, in the long term, be the kind of white out factory. So that is mm -hmm. that there was no operators in here required because everything was going to be automated. Now they're not there yet. Um, but they are about 60, I think, or 65% mm -hmm. of their processes had been uh, automated to the point where we actually got to see what called a, a flexible automated line in that as the product was coming down the assembly line, the jigs and fixtures could actually tell each robot and each station what they were in at that, and they were then able to be um, 
as assembled in a manner that was appropriate to their ID. Mm. So the, the, the correct firmware could be downloaded on the go, the correct parts could be picked and applied to it, the, mm. the, the, the production test that was on the functional test was all appropriate to the little cradle that had yeah. the ID that the parts are in. So it was flexible in that sense that um, while they were running a bunch of walkie-talkies down, it was a variety of models mm. and they were all just coming in at you know, the line. Mm. So um, that was sort of something that was quite unique because there, there wasn't that same association with um, you know, the line having to be set up or, yes. or set down and the operators there. And in fact, um, they actually had a little sign in one of the windows uh, that said operator forbidden engineer only. Mm. Um, and that was because of the automated line. They didn't actually have any operators in the line. So it was only the engineers who came to set up and, and maintain the, the robots and the and the equipment, so it was it was quite a contrast to always thinking about the fact there's going to be that operator there. Mm. So that was sort of quite different. And um, one of the things that they sort of talked to us in the presentation was the number of pat patterns that they had across business processes. So it wasn't just the automation of the, of the of the say the factory floor, but it was automation of the entire business. So from uh, receipt of a customer purchase order mm -hmm. to that dispatch. Uh, everything that could be done to automate that and the intelligence and, and data gathering that would be required to facilitate that. Yes. So that, that's actually quite um, unique and I think there was something like 20 plus patterns to, to be able to, to look at some of these some of these things and um, I think they, they also talked about where best practice was mm -hmm. uh, and collaborating with Siemens and, and other companies to be able to move towards that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just fantastic mm. to be able to be in that environment. Yeah. Um, you are talking about business processes and uh, one of the things that I found interesting, well, there were many things I found interesting about Hatero, I could talk about that for the next two hours, um, but uh, in terms of how the customer interacts with the factory, what they really want to be is the, uh, the flexible automated factory for the world. So at the time we were visiting, uh, they were talking about, uh, they were about to release their app, like phone app, so that their customers could open uh, the app on the phone and see in real time the production status, what the production line is doing, which units are moving through it, how many have been produced, what the failure rate is, um, and I drill down to every individual device so they could see this radio has been manufactured at this time and it passed these tests and these are the test results. And they could pull that up live from their phone as the devices are running along the production line. So that sort of level of insight into what's going on in the factory is amazing. I've never heard of anything like that. I mean, the best that you can hope for normally is a report at the end. Like all of your, your boards come out of the production line and they'll tell you what your failure rate was and that's it. Um, but being able to see live every individual device on your phone, that's just incredible. Uh, and just to elaborate a little bit on Bella's point about the flexible line and the, um, the jigs that travel down it, one of the uh, the way you think about optimizing a production line normally is that you have you run a batch. So you set your line up for one batch and then you have lots of identical devices coming down it. The amazing thing about these lines is that you could send different devices down the production line randomly by random order and the production line would just do the correct thing for each device. So uh, I hadn't heard of anything like that before either. That was quite amazing. So. Um, uh, a question from Dean, um, he wants to know, will we be able to meet some local startups on the trip? Ah, that's a really good question. So um, we did get a chance to meet startups on the last trip, and so would you like to talk a bit about that? Uh, which local is the local? Ah, local. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are two the classifications, there are two types of local. There is local to, um, to us, so Australian startups, and one of the things that I found really good about the trip was travelling with um, with other engineers and entrepreneurs. So over the course of the trip, obviously you're immersed with other people for a week or so, you get to talk to them about what they're working on. So there is that peer dynamic going on. You learn a lot from the other people on the trip and also local to China. And um, we did meet uh, local startups in China and we also met a number of other companies from other countries because we went to a couple of uh, startup incubators and accelerators, including Hacks. So um, maybe talk a little bit about um, the opportunities with things like incubators in China, which is not something I had thought much about previously. So I, I guess sort of in terms of that uh, ecosystem, there was probably sort of three main events that we had. When we arrived, we actually went to Maker Faire, um, and 
uh, usually in that startup sort of thing, you, you kind of that journey is kind of to make something, make something a bit more, make something to manufacture and, and then sort of come through. So we were able to um, meet some makers and startups um, during the Maker Fair mm -hmm. uh, and look at some uh, makers who'd actually made quite successful products. Um, and a lot of it around sort of also sort of STEM mm -hmm. um, equipment and, and, and toys for kids and those sort of things. But there was certainly a, a section around that. Last year's Maker Fair theme was make a GoPro, so that idea from somebody who might be manufacturing uh, for themselves to somebody who is now manufacturing for others and taking mm. on that, that step. So that sort of set the tone for the tour. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I think on the Tuesday night, uh, we had a um, attended a startup event that was organised by Austrade. Mm -hmm. So we'd been in communication with Austrade of Alatour um, and they'd sort of agreed to support the tour by helping to uh, host an ecosystem event. Uh, and at that event, it was uh, actually open to uh, local startups as well, both uh, any international startups that were there as well as Chinese. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a panel discussion where we got to hear from uh, representatives from uh, various sort of innovation and open hardware type platforms as well as ha uh, um, sort of we had a representative from Hacks, so looking at accelerators, uh, as well as Austrade and their land, uh, landing pads and, and those sort of things. So we got to hear the panel discussion and afterwards mingle with a, a, a number of people and so we actually got to meet a couple of Australian startups who were there in Shenzhen manufacturing at the moment. Mm. Um, Including Whitelex, who we got to visit. Yes. Which was a very important one. Yes, uh, there was also Aurora 3D, who was mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of scanning, um, the 3D scanner, and um, so we got to hear Raul from that uh, that, um, that company speak. We also got to meet uh, Glenn from Smart Shepherd, mm -hmm. um, who is also an Australian, is also an Australian startup, an ad tech, uh, and then um, we actually had Glenn host us at Hacks. Um, so I was a Hacks as a startup accelerator, mm -hmm. and so we got to hear a little bit about uh, you know sort of Glenn's. Um, perspective on that as well as sort of visit the facility and understand um, the kind of services that were offered but also um, at the start we got to see there's a wall there with all the sort of different startups that go through it and actually see there's a legacy there of Australian startups mm. uh, and the various kind of successes that they that they've had um, so yeah we sort of got to do some of those ecosystem events um, and then also sort of through that general collaboration of the cohort that was there um, we got to sort of be able to interact with everybody who came on the tour and learn about the products that they were making, mm -hmm. the experiences that they had around taking their product to manufacturing or prototype and those sort of things. So mm -hmm. I think there was generally uh, quite a lot of ability to be able to interact on that level. Yeah. And so if someone has uh, has been prototyping and has an idea for something they want to take through to a product, um, it opens up other possibilities. So traditionally you would think of keeping your company uh, based, say, in Australia or wherever and simply treating the Chinese partners at arm's length. But one of the things that was really interesting about Hacks and other places was how many companies had relocated themselves, or at least their technology teams, into China so they could do all of their development there, um, where they are right in the middle of the electronics markets and they can interact with all of the suppliers. So what they can do is then optimise their product development for the companies that are then going to be manufacturing it in, at scale. And I thought that was really interesting. So. For people that come along on the trip, um, that can be a bit of an eye-opening experience as well. You can see possibilities about um, taking your ideas to market or um, turning them into products that might be a different path to what you thought about in the past, but uh, yeah, there are some very powerful opportunities there. So um, I'll just try to catch up on, on some questions. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, okay, so Dion Chapman said, I love the Shenzhen tour, I love these markets, been so many times. Um, and said, see if you can meet up with Strange Parts, who was on YouTube and made the sound port for the iPhone 6 or 7. Um, yeah, so for those of you who haven't seen it, you should go and have a look at um, Strange Parts on YouTube. Um, he is based in China and um, has done some really interesting projects. So with the, um, the iPhone, what he wanted to do was put a headphone port back on it. And uh, so he investigated what was involved in manufacturing the parts to make that happen, <clears throat> including designing a custom flex PCB that would fit within the case of the iPhone 7 and having the case mill to make the hole for the socket. And he ended up making a, um, a fully functional headphone port on an iPhone 7 
using the resources that are available right there in the markets and around the markets in Shenzhen. And it is a great illustration of the, the, the skills and the services that are available. If you think about, say, an iPhone and you want to modify this, do a customized version of an iPhone, that's a pretty extreme thing to undertake. Uh, but he showed how you can develop um, retrofit parts that will go into it and then customize it. And uh, that's the sort of thing that goes on continuously within that ecosystem because the Chinese manufacturing ecosystem is very much uh, based around very rapid iteration. So they're, uh, they take existing designs and then modify them and then just keep modifying them. And so you go through a very rapid um, series of different versions of the product and, uh, and it's on a very tight timeline. It's not multi-year development. It's like weeks or months to market or days in some cases. And part of being on the tour really exposes you to that as well and shows you the sorts of things you can do when you have direct interaction with the companies that make the parts that go into the phones and other devices that you use every day. Um, so, uh, don't think we have any other questions at the moment, um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about what your plans are for the next tour. So after the last one, it was a, uh, I know <laughs> that after the tour, you were basically <laughs> zonked or burnt out. And uh, for a long time, every, everybody that went on the tour was saying, are you going to do this again? Are you going to do this again? And you wouldn't commit to anything. And then eventually you decided, yes, you'll do it. Um, but <laughs> what sort of things do you have in mind for the tour this time? And uh, what would the experience be like for people that go on it? So uh, yeah, it, you are quite right. It was pretty hard to make a decision to go again. It was uh, it was a pretty big undertaking. Um, it was actually very fun when we got there, and uh, you know, it was an extraordinary experience even for, uh, for me. But it was a substantial amount of work. And when we got back, I sort of wanted to take a few deep breaths mm. and, and sort of um, you know recalibrate a little bit and, and sort of think about um, you know where it was going to go and how it was going to go. Um, and then sort of we had. Uh, Carl uh, do the videos mm -hmm. uh, and he did sort of an 18 part series and it was funny because it just felt like the tour kept going and going because every Saturday or Sunday morning <laughs> you know the episode else. would come out um, and it, it just really felt like the tour really only finished when he sort of mm. did the last episode and by the time he did the last episode I was kind of keen to go again <laughs> yeah. and I, I, I guess there'd been a number of people who'd seen the videos and heard about last year and it sort of commented you know, is there going to be another one? You know, would you do something like that? And I sort of thought, well, I mean, it can't be as hard the second time around. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done a lot of the, the groundwork. Uh, and I, I, I was sort of, um, I guess, quite systematic in the processes that I used um, last year. And so I, uh, uh, you know, it was probably a little bit more pedantic about all the forms that needed to be done. And I was mm -hmm. uh, a little bit unsure as, you know, how it would sort of work out with risks and travel insurance and all those sort of things. And so I actually did quite a lot of work to prepare those sort of things. And so this time I sort of thought, oh, I could probably leverage some of, some of those aspects so that it could be a little bit um, easier to put another tour together. But at the same time, um, people were kind of keen to go. Uh, alumni or people who mm -hmm. went last year were wanting to know whether there was another tour. And mm -hmm. in fact, could they come along again? So yeah. <laughs> I guess there was some pretty positive experience. And um, just with a number of other things that were happening in my life, there was just a, a little bit of bandwidth to perhaps do another one again without necessarily committing to something in the future. I think mm. it's always probably going to be a, as it comes, you know, what are the other things that are happening at this point in time? Mm. And, you know, there was the opportunity and, yeah, it was just sort of being able to sort of put together. So I'm hoping to deliver another experience that's going to be curated and immersive. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll attempt to take care of all the logistics, uh, including flights and those sort of things this year. Um, we've opened it up to have people uh, apply both uh, nationally and internationally. Whereas last year, pretty much everybody that came was from Melbourne, so mm. that made the logistics a bit easier. Yes. Um, this time around, and we had 12 people last last year. This time we're going for about 16 people. We're going to try and give it a go with uh, the travel agent that we worked with last year to see what we can do to make that uh, as smooth again for both na na you know, national and international people. And, have people arrive together and mm. have that experience. It's about sort of doing it as a, as a group and um, being immersed in that. So I'm hoping that 
um, as we go through the process and I get to see the people upon the tour, I'm having an interview with them, getting to understand who they are, what their motivations are, and I'm, you know, I'm wanting to create another quite customised experience. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been trying to uh, look at the events and look at the itinerary in such a way that's going to engage the people that we have and try and get a cohort together that's actually going to maximally benefit from the itinerary that we develop. So yeah. it's about making that yeah, experience. And I know you put a lot of work into that in particular last time and uh, there were a number of factories that we visited that you had organised but there were also a number of factories that were either suggested or requested by tour participants and in some cases there were companies that um, tour participants had already done business with but they'd never actually visited in person and by making those connections it meant that uh, it was an opportunity to go and see the factories that were making their own, making their products. Um, but it also meant that the tour and all of the different places we went um, were very personally relevant. And, uh, and because over the course of the tour, we talked to each other about the sorts of jobs we were, projects we were working on, um, it made it very relevant. For example, um, Brian was working on the Zesty Nimble, which is an um, an extruder for 3D printers and he was having custom gears made for it and we visited the factory that makes the gears that go into his extruder and because I had over the course of the trip I've been talking to Brian about his business and what he was doing when you get to go and visit the factory that's making the product that's uh, that's really significant and it also means that you have much more um, it gives you more faith and trust in them and by visiting places that have done business with people you know, it, uh, that sort of interpersonal introduction goes a really long way. And I mm. think very much also the, the stories that people bring with them. So uh, even in the case of uh, IT, so um, Joe John sort of let me know that he was quite keen to go and visit this factory and if it didn't quite fit in the tour itinerary, he was quite happy to sort of go and do this on his own and sort of said, well, hang on, let's let's have a look at what the cohort is. Is this going to be something that's going to interest the cohort? And we looked at the theme of open hardware being something that was quite strong in last year's cohort, the people that we had, a number of people that actually used the, the Sonoff products mm. um, and were quite keen on some of the, the aspects of it. There was a differentiation around quality and cost. Mm -hmm. um, and so it actually, you know, some things that he thought he could he was probably going to do as a side sort of activity actually was incorporated into the, into the main, mm. main event. And I remember... Specifically, one of the things that I recall from the song of mine was after we finished and we're sort of about to leave, I was thinking, well, no, that, that was okay, but you know, I'd just been to Hytera the day before. And, yeah. But as I was walking out, I sort of realized it actually wasn't any tools on the line mm. because um, what they had actually was they designed it for, for cost, and, uh, and, and, and as part of that, everything just snapped together. And so there mm. wasn't a need to have the screwdrivers, they had the heat safe machine, but mm. there wasn't many hand tools or other tools on the line because the product had actually been designed. Mm. It was optimized, you know, for, optimized that for that process. Price point, yeah. um, and that was just sort of a really nice, consider, you know, sort of subtle difference. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, um, it, it's those kind of things that kind of make them. Here we are almost a year later. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I have quite the memories of something that might not have even been part of that uh, tour experience had somebody not suggested. So I think it's quite important to um, have that input from the group as well mm. and try and develop something that... Um, you know, it means that there's going to be those stories and interactions uh, and ways that people have found out about the suppliers, how they've interacted with them, what they've delivered for them, all those sort of things I think mm -hmm. are quite important. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, now we've got a few more videos that we have queued up and um, are there any particular that you would like to play uh, before we get on to wrapping up? So we've got um, maybe factory options. All right, so... One thing that was apparent from the tour is that, uh, that there's, the factories are quite different in terms of what capability they have, I guess what scale, what quality and, and costing. So the factories uh, were on a much bigger range than I thought they would be and they were a lot more specialised. Obviously you went from the kind of the low small produc production to the really high production quality and quantity. That's a really interesting difference. One of the things that was valuable in visiting so many factories was seeing the wide range of scale, quality. Wouldn't say uh, that we saw anything that was low quality but we saw some processes such as high terror where the, the level of obsession with the quality was like nothing I've ever seen before. They 
really are on the cutting edge of, of manufacturing and that there is a real need for that but at the same time we're not going to see a disappearance in the f people like HLH for a very long time because they're meeting a very different need for manufacturing as well. So I think for the people who are you know scared that manufacturing is going to take over everything, when the technology for the, to, to make a factory like Hyterra comes down then someone like HLH will probably use it but while that's not the case then everyone else is probably safe for a while. So that little video showed uh, a variety of factories. It, uh, it really shows the um, everything from the like the, the vacuum molding, which feels traditional, industrial, sort of dirty, all the way through to high terror, which everything is gloss white and there's not a speck of dust in the air. Um, and it, it really does illustrate that there are a variety of suppliers, and it's a matter of finding the one that's appropriate to a particular needs. And in many cases, as you said, like with IT, they've optimised their process not around expensive robots, but around uh, making the design easy to assemble so it all just clips together. Um, in other situations, you might need to solve the problem by using expensive robots. And I think that was what, that was a really big beneficial thing for me on the tour, was seeing that variety of factories. Um, now, we've got a few questions that um, I need to uh, catch up on. So, uh, let me just jump back here. So, Unfiltered Opinions asked, um, have Superhouse considered Thailand in comparison to China as a manufacturing hub possibility? Now, I haven't personally, if you're asking Superhouse, um, but Vela, so your experience uh, with Thailand compared to China, or you've worked not just in China, you've obviously dealt with um, other countries and manufacturers, so what's your experience? So, I haven't dealt with um, Thailand per se, but I... Um do you know, I guess from sort of that manufacturing industry or, or some of the other people we have, um, they've certainly been targeting a few se sectors and in particular around plastics. Uh, and I do know of some companies that have sort of ended up uh, setting up either, a, I guess, a sister facility or, or, or sort of moved some of the production back in there. And that there's actually been uh, quite a few specific industries that they've been targeting mm -hmm. uh, and looking to develop themselves in, in that particular area. So it's certainly something to keep an eye for. Okay. Um. So, um, Unexpected Maker, so Sion asked, how many will be going on the tour this time? Any repeats from last tour? John? John? <laughs> um, so, you mentioned 16, so uh, do you think the group will be slightly bigger this time than it was last time? Yes, so last year we had uh, about uh, 12 people uh, and uh, sort of the main group, and then we had uh, John Botter from IFX join us for a few days, uh, we had Carl from Fab9 who was there, and so... Mm -hmm. Um, on, a, on a couple of the days, we were sort of the 14, 15, or 16, and, and the mm. tour guide. So uh, basically, it's kind of the size of the minibus that we can accommodate, as yeah. well as being <laughs> considerate that some of the factories that we visit are pretty small. Mm. Um, and so they might have the facilities to host uh, a large group at all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're looking this year to go slightly larger, but still capped at about 16. Um, mm. So that, that is sort of what we're aiming for. Uh, we had had... Um, some of the people from last year express a desire to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we are hoping to do is have a couple of uh, alumni on there uh, and they'll take on a, a bit of a mentoring role and, and sort of help out with some of the aspects uh, while in Shenzhen and making sure that everybody has an awesome experience. Yeah, I suppose that's a bit of a balancing act because you have the danger that everybody wants to come back and just end up with the same group again. Um, and so you'll need to limit how many people yes. come back as alumni <laughs> and, uh, and try to let as many people as possible experience it for the first time. Definitely. Yeah. We, are, we are having a cap from the alumni. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but say, yeah. saying that, ultimately, we want, to, we want to be able to put together a cohort that's going to be a great fit, um, that we have the, the right mix of people coming along, of the right interests, um, and with a, you know, with a slightly larger, uh, larger group being able to balance all those uh, all those needs as well. So it's mm. um, it's about you know, making that, that experience come together mm -hmm. uh, and also take some input sort of from the travel agent and, and some of those sort of things around yeah. optimising <clears throat> some of those things. Mm. Okay. Um, did you, actually, did you have any issues with taking that many people over? Um, like in terms of things like, uh, one question that people might have is, what's the process with visas and how hard is it to get a group of people into China? Because traditionally we thought of China as being a very closed country. And um, so can you just talk a little bit about that? So with the tour, I actually used a, uh, an Australian-based travel agent who um, 
actually specializing in China to us, mm. uh, to help with the logistics aspect of that. And so because we were going through a travel agent, we were officially a tour. Mm -hmm. um, and as such, um, they were able to sort of help us with the paperwork around the visas and those sort of things. So um, they were able to, prov to provide all the invitation letters and all of those things. And so we come into China as a tour group. Um, mm. And, and that sort of enables us to um, leverage some of those things. She also helped us to organize things like the travel insurance and the other prerequisite documents that we need uh, to be able to come to. So you must have a return AFA, you must have your accommodation book, you mm. must have travel insurance. So we were able to get all of those things done as a group. She was able to help us prepare all that paperwork and present that and, and sort of manage that. And then the individuals were then responsible for getting the tour, uh, sorry, getting the visa for the tour. And so they would have to then go to the embassy um, and be able to, to get that process, but they had all the paperwork there um, and we provide all the information on how to submit um, the online documentation of those sort of things. So I think it went pretty uh, pretty smoothly uh, in terms of that aspect and probably uh, the only thing I think with, if, um, if we come on a tourist visa, it's about a six, six month visa, so people want to have an extra one. I think we, we're going to allow a little bit of flexibility around that this year and see um, whether we can get some um, if people do want that extra flexibility of coming back in the 12 months, they might mm. get their own invitation letter um, from from, a, from the, a business that they might be collaborating yes. with, but we can still put together the rest of the tour, the tour package around the um, the paperwork required for the visa. So I think mm. yeah, overall, um, we'll sort of take care of most of those things. Yeah, sure. So um, if you want to get into China, there are a couple of different visa classes that you can take. Uh, what we went on is the tourist visa. And you can also go on a business visa, but that requires that you have a company, a Chinese company, um, specifically invite you. So you need to be doing business with a Chinese company, and the um, the bar is higher in terms of qualifying for the visa. So going over as a tourist is definitely the easier thing to do, but it does cap the length of your visa. So if you want to make multiple trips and you are legitimately doing business in China, then getting a business visa is probably the way to go. It's just more paperwork, more time, and you need the cooperation of a Chinese company to make it happen. It's a bit, uh, it, it's one of those trade-offs where we probably, you know, if somebody desperately needed that and they hadn't quite the going to, we could probably organise it, but as we're having people kind of join the tour a little bit later or get organised with their paperwork and those sort of things, this was something we could leave till the end hmm. and manage, and it wasn't going to be a burden on one of the companies that we were visiting. Yes. Because you do have to actually share a lot of your personal information and your passport details those sort of things who so were also able to sort of be, um, you know, consider of that sensitive information and make sure that that was appropriately handled uh, with the travel agent and, and sort of how that information was managed to ensure that everybody in the tour uh, was happy with that. Yeah, and I don't think anybody, um, other than having to go and sit in the queue, I don't think anybody had any particular trouble getting their visa. It was just a matter of filling in the paperwork, doing, providing the necessary documentation. So did you hear if anybody had any problems in particular or uh, was rejected? No, it was just the, the queue, so yeah. a couple of times people had to come back because I had to wait too long. <laughs> yeah. Or like me, I just you know, showed up on the wrong day for my appointment because I voted on my calendar. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, Dion um, made the comment, it's much easier than when I went the first time in 2000. Yeah, China um, has been going through a process of opening up in terms of international trade dramatically over um, over the last few years. So in 2000, the, the process of getting into China was much more difficult than it is now. And uh, it's, you can go, my, you know, my father-in-law, for example, went just a couple of months ago as a tourist and I went to Beijing, I think, and Shanghai and um, wandered around and visited all the tourist spots. So it's, um, it's a much more accessible country now than it was in the past. And with the, with the tour, I made the uh, sort of executive decision that I wanted to fly straight in mm. and fly straight out. I, um, although Hong Kong and Guangzhou are not that far away uh, in terms of the distance to Shenzhen, I'd originally had planned that we'd fly straight into Shenzhen mm -hmm. and fly straight out, and that would sort of minimise having to have people get their passports out again, having to work through visas or, or those sort of things. Mm. Um, it just turned out that the flight that we wanted to fly on um, was cancelled uh, and or they were notified early in advance, and so we actually flew into Guangzhou and then flew out of Shenzhen. But it's much easier rather than having to go through that extra bit of water, uh, mm. you know, and ta you know, with Hong Kong and stuff. But it, it's quite accessible and yeah. easy to, to travel. And, yeah. Quite. Yeah. Well, even even that's a big change. Just being able to fly directly into China now, like straight into Shenzhen or um, one of those other major cities, 
uh, when the, on even on my previous trip, which was only a couple of years before, I had to go in through Hong Kong and then uh, get a visa at the border and then travel over that way. So um, there were very few entry points to China and it was very tightly controlled, whereas now um, you can access China in many more ways and go in directly. Uh, so um, just uh, before we wrap up, uh, did you want to we go with this other video, the, uh, the final one, and then we'll talk about what is actually involved in uh, going along on the next tour? Yeah, we, we saw a really wide range across the spectrum. So I could see firms that you'd use for in prototyping, firms you'd use for products where you only want to sell, you're only going to sell a couple of thousand of them, and then ones when it's time to make the big step up, the serious partners, and they're all there. They're hugely different, and but they're going to, you need to find a manufacturing partner that's tailored to your needs because they will be out there. I don't really think you can do much else other than go on a tour like this. The only way to wrap your head around how the manufacturing is going to work. When you look at pictures of factories on the internet, that doesn't tell you anything. Going and seeing them operate and just learning how different they can all be, you don't just open the yellow pages and go, I want that factory. You need to know what your factory's going to do, how it's going to do it, what sort of capacity it's got. It's just, there's a whole world of complexity there that you don't see until you go to Shenzhen. Okay, um, now one of the other things that I skipped over in the questions, I overlooked it earlier, is Sally asked um, about whether there are any IP issues and trade tariffs um, when dealing with Chinese suppliers. So what concerns, for example, with your, um, your previous position where you're working on that product, um, how do you deal with IP issues? I think um, one of the things when it comes to IP is to understand your supplier and also understand where the IP is in your product, and you know, whether it's the software, whether it's the hardware, whether it's a combination of the two. So being able to um, understand that. Uh, and then secondly, being able to look at what the manufacturing you might be considering and that supply chain. So when we visited the um, factories in Shenzhen, this was one of the questions that a number of participants asked. And as we went through the factories, they were able to explain the various ways in which they dealt with some of those things. So um, one of the factories that we went um, on the hardware jigs and fixtures, they didn't actually identify the product mm. um, that was actually used to manufacture those fixtures. So uh, the operators didn't actually know uh, which specific company or which specific product they were working for. They were actually abstracted from them. And in order to find out, you have to look up the unique reference number of the jig and fixture on the computer and then sort of work mm. your way down to those sort of things. So there was sort of what the operator knew, what a manager knew, and maybe sort of what the next level knew. There were sort of levels of abstraction there. Um, there was other companies that um, you know, had been quite familiar with dealing with Westerners and the idea that Westerners uh, wanted to work through having the non-disclosure agreement mm. and, and certain um, documents in place and then helping helping them adapt those to what might be appropriate uh, for China. So uh, there's slightly different documents than just an, an NDA that you might, they might use. Um, so there was some of those things that they informed us about the document control procedures that they used. But there was also the things around what the companies did with the scrap material, for instance. So when they developed your prototype, uh, uh, you know, would they then dispose of that item correctly? So it didn't just go in the bin where the next person could take it <laughs> <Yes>. out. Um, <laughs> but that's, so um, part of that experience in being able to visit the factories is you can ask some of these questions and you mm. can also get the perspective of how that factory has dealt with some of those things. Um, and if they've had any issues in, in, in the past or what the processes are around that they've, they've put for that. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to being able to also understand what the supply chain is and how does the factory also manage that for their suppliers. So mm. uh, you might have a factory that maybe does your box build and assembles everything, but then maybe they send out the plastics to another company or the PCA goes somewhere else and maybe the one bit that you're interested in protecting is one of those sub-assemblies. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have a look at that relationship that they have with their suppliers those sort of things. So it's really being able to explore some of those things with the factories as well mm -hmm. um, and being able to ask some of those questions and, and see what they're, um, what they're doing to manage those issues. Mm -hmm. In terms of tariffs and, and, and things, so, the, so there is a duty and the like but when you import uh, a, a bit from China or, or anywhere else uh, and the, there's some element around you know, what the GSC component of that might be but also around the different items that you might be importing and, and the charges with that. Mm. So that's something that I guess if you're developing a product or if you're going to sell it, then you need to build that into your costing model. And you can understand what those costs are. So 
So mm-hmm. whether you want to be able to pass them on and manage the cash flow or, or those sort of things. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and um, David asked, how many days does the tour run for? Uh, it was approximately a week last time, but maybe just give us a very brief rundown of the sequence of events, like um, departure and then travel and how many days are spent and then yep. return. So we will allow for one day of transit at the start of the, the start of the tour. So last year it was the Friday. We, we have that as a travel travel day. Um, from Melbourne to Shenzhen, it's about eight hours or, or so. Um, so it was a sort of mid midday kind of flight. So we arrived there into the into the evening. Um, you know, sort of had the dinner, the group dinner, and got ourselves settled into the hotel. And so officially, I guess the first day of being in China and touring was on the Saturday. Um, from the Saturday right through to Friday, we had a scheduled itinerary, both free time as well as uh, very scheduled with Not much free time. <laughs> uh, and other things. But you know, um, and then on the Saturday, um, as we kind of wrapped up with the electronics markets, by about the, the midday, we had the lunch and got ready to go to the airport and flew out uh, Saturday evening, arriving back um, Sunday morning. So this is obviously for, for Australia from from Melbourne, mm. but uh, that would sort of be our aim this year as well to have the one day up front scheduled as that transit day and having people come in and hopefully we can get people coming in on the same day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then after that, that gives us uh, a, you know, a week to be able to to, to enjoy Shenzhen and then to uh, mm-hmm. head back out. Yeah, so it's taking advantages of the weekends at both ends um, to make sure that you really have that whole week plus a bit of extra time there on the ground able to visit uh, factories and see interesting things. And last time... Uh, the trip was timed to coincide with Make a Fair Shenzhen, which was on the weekend, the Saturday and the Sunday immediately before. Um, but this year, there is a little bit of uncertainty about, about the dates. So uh, last I heard, you weren't really sure exactly what date the trip would be, uh, but there is a possibility of also making it coincide with another event. So um, <laughs> could you explain what that is? Yeah. So uh, just because we've got a bit of the lag between uh, the Make a Fair and us needing to sort of make a decision, I've had a look at... Um, what other opportunities there are around sort of the November time frame that we want to go. So the China High Tech Fair um, is also on, I think, between the 14th and 18th of November. Um, and it's more of a trade show than, and as a maker fair, was more sort of around makers and the like. So I've just been looking at that itinerary so, um, and, and how that event might fit the tour. So probably by Wednesday we should have a, a clear uh, executive mm-hmm. decision exactly when the yep. dates of the tour are going to be in terms of that you know, a one day for transit and the start and the end of the tour, and then obviously we'll have to consider what people's uh, travel arrangements are. Yeah, so um, you don't have a definite date yet, but it's going to be somewhere middle of November, that sort of yeah. period. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure John can uh, post an update on uh, <laughs> free trains, but I'll, I'll certainly yeah. try and get it out there on the on the on the channels. But uh, uh, yeah. yeah, sort of making sure we coincide with that week, and then just having a look at sort of where the flights and and mm. and, and things are. So probably. Um, reach out to travel agents and see if we can yeah. um, work, you know, work that out so we've, we've, we've got that sort of. Yeah. Um, and so at the moment you're taking applications and you're not necessarily accepting everybody. This is a curated tour and you have to go through the interview process. Um, but for people that are interested in going along to this, uh, how do they apply? How do they find out more? So uh, on our website, which John will put up the details yep. <laughs> uh, after, there there is basically a, I'll an put applic- this in the chat right now. <laughs> there is an application form, and uh, it's uh, I you know I think it's not very arduous, but it does ask a couple of questions so that we try and understand both your motivation and interest in going the tour and where you are in your hardware journey. So the first step is to uh, fill out the application form, and then subsequent to that, uh, you'll get a little bit of, you'll get a notification about. Um, organizing a sort of face-to-face chat, a virtual face-to-face chat of about 15 minutes, a half an hour, just so I can get to know the prospective participants a little bit better, mm-hmm. understand a little bit more about what you want to get out of the tour, where you are on your hardware journey, and start to really think about how that's going to fit into this curated experience. Um, and it's also just a great chance to, to meet people, particularly because, um, you know, in this case, if we're accepting people from other than Melbourne, we're probably not going to meet till we get to Shenzhen. Yes. So being able to do this is that first step, and then later on we'll have some sort of online sessions just so we can start to build that cohort rapport mm-hmm. and get people you know engaged. So when we're there, we're already excited and going to go. Yeah. 
So you've got the um, the application form on the site. Is there also like a, just a newsletter or a mailing list that you can sign up for if people are interested in hearing more about what goes on but they're not ready to actually apply yet? Yes, and so the, there is def definitely uh, a link uh, to uh, something that you can subscribe to. Yep. And if you have any questions or queries, there's just a, a little sort of form that you can sort of fill out there and the person who responds will be uh, <laughs> um, myself. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think there's plenty of, of ways to... Uh, Get there. I haven't necessarily been very active on the social media and those sort of things. This is kind of like that part-time side project. Yep. Um, so it kind of only comes alive in, in, the, in the time that we're sort of really trying to popular, popularise the event to get the, uh, the applicants. But I'm certainly keen to, to do a little bit more this time around, um, making people engage with the journey and, and mm -hmm. hopefully some of the alumni will be able to help with those sort of things and even yep. something like this. Okay. Um, Dion asked... Um, whether you have YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and anything else, Twitter. So I think you're hard works with an X on Twitter. Is that right? Hard, hard, hard works with an X underscore IO. Hard works underscore IO. John, um, John will put all of these <laughs> yeah. emails together. I, I am uh, not a social media savvy mm -hmm. uh, at all. Uh, I've sort of focused on organizing the tour um, and hoping that uh, any bit of word, of word of mouth sort of gets there yeah. a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll sort of make sure all those uh, details are posted in the channel for, for people. There's not too many and most of them really sort of uh, trying to let people know that we're um, there and, and sort of trying to take applications and those sort of things. Um, yep. But you know, if people have some ideas about the kind of information that they'd like, um, that would be great because then I can sort of make sure that there's that great experience going out. Um, the other thing is we actually, as I mentioned, had the 18-part video series yes. uh, last year, and that's really in-depth oh, <laughs> in, <depth laughs> in terms of the factory, factories that we visit and all those sort yeah. of things. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we'll put a link to that, of, to, to that as well, but um, it's sort of under the State of Electronics uh, playlist. Mm. There's one there for the tours, uh, but people can sort of check that out and really get a mm. good sense of uh, what it's like to come to the tour, even if you don't come along. Yes. So um, you've... If you subscribe to this channel, you've probably seen my IT um, tour video, but uh, we, we're also very lucky that Carl came along. Um, Carl is a professional filmmaker and he had his camera running the whole time. So he's produced an enormous quantity of footage coming out of this. And uh, so if you have a look at the State of Electronics channel on YouTube, you will see a whole playlist, which is um, a whole series of video of tours of different factories, not just IT, but all of the different places that we went and also just general um, you know, environmental things and trips through the markets in Shenzhen. So definitely go and check out the State of Electronics channel on YouTube. So for your Twitter, so it's hardworks underscore IO, is that correct? I think so. That looks right? Okay. Um, and Dodgy Brothers asked, approximate costs? So uh, in AU dollars, because I have no other reference, the cost is approximately four thousand five hundred, mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, that will be all inclusive except for the visa, which is sort of between a, between a hundred to a hundred and fifty uh, AU, and of, of and of course spending money mm. uh, is at your own expense. <laughs> yes. uh, but most of the meals and, and things like that will be um, be provided, and that's costed at a single room. Uh, what we will do is we will look at. Um, we normally allow people to sort of give us the option whether they want a single or to share and then we kind of see what we can accommodate and likewise with the flights it really depends where people will the final applicants come coming from and so it's an approximate cost and we'll kind of put the final cost um, might almost be on an individualized base depending mm. on where people are coming from and yes. some other things around that yeah one thing i really liked about the last trip was that the uh, the price really was all inclusive so uh from the time you leave you, if you didn't want to buy snacks and things during the day, you'd hardly have to spend a dollar. It's like breakfast is there at the hotel. There's dinner at a different restaurant every night. That's all covered. Um, so that basically, you, for that package price, you get everything, the entire experience. And um, we have a tour, a tour guide will be allocated to us and be with us for the entire trip. Yes. And they are there to make our experience as comfortable as possible, to order the food wherever, or, you know, where we go, to cover those translation issues. Um, we had a couple a couple of nights we went to a few different events and things and, and they were able to facilitate all of that um, all of that for us. So we have a um, bus and a driver allocated to us. Mm -hmm. So all of those um, 
things are in, included within that and um, yeah, we're able to, um, I think, make it a pretty good experience. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. And uh, if anybody's thinking about doing this, I really highly recommend it. If you have any interest in electronics manufacturing and you have maybe have an idea for a product that you want to take to market or you just want to see how the um, how products are made, you really should get on this tour. Uh, I think we need to wrap it up. And um, David gave a double thumbs up for State of Electronics, yes. So um, Carl von Moller's work on the State of Electronics channel is, um, is really good. And he's actually a professional filmmaker, which means that his stuff looks good. It doesn't look terrible like mine. <laughs> and he gets his audio right. It doesn't have all this noise like mine does. So um, thanks, Bella. This has been really good. Thanks for coming along and taking the time to talk about all of this. If, uh, I'm sure people will have more questions following up. Please get in touch with Bella through the hardworks.io site. Subscribe to that list for notifications. And maybe I will see you in China. We get to spend a week together uh, going around electronics markets, visiting factories, and having a great time. So thanks for coming along to the live stream. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will talk to you again uh, soon. Thanks, Bella. Thank you.